And welcome again to New Home Baptist Church. We got a brand new headset today. The other one was cutting up the last two weeks, so uh, bear with us. We'll work through it and get it adjusted correctly. Thank you uh, for being here. And I would like to say, and I hope that each and every one of us can say this, in God we still trust. Today marks the 21st anniversary of the most horrific terrorist attacks ever on humankind. And you know that I'm speaking of 9-11 from 2001. A total of 2,996 people lost their lives that morning. Uh, not to think about the ones that had sicknesses and problems and other issues stemming from that. So this morning as we start, I don't want to tarry too long, but I've just got some things that I want to cover and I want to make mention and I'd like for you to really pay close attention because I am a patriotic guy. My, uh, my grandfather served in the military, as did my dad and my uncle, and uh, I just have a, a warm place in my heart for anyone who will, who will take that challenge and serve our country. You know, on that day, 21 years ago, exactly like today and every day, men, women, boys, and girls were just going about their day doing what they always had done. Going to school, going to work, babies were being born, funerals had been lined up for later that day. Uh, there were sporting events to take place that night. There were trains, tr planes, traffic jams, hospitals, uh, you name it. It was a day just like every other day until it wasn't. You may remember the eerie feeling of no planes in the sky. A very few cars going up and down the road. It seemed like a silence that we had not felt in quite some time. I thought about it this week. It took me back some scripture passages that we find in Matthew 24 that talks about the days before Noah. And listen to what the Word says. It says, when the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time that Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working in the field. One will be taking and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taking and the other left. Now, don't twist this around this morning and say, the preacher said that God made that happen. The preacher said that God uh, was in charge and orchestrated it, all that. But let me just say this. God like in every tragic situation, God was there. Make no mistake, God was there. Oh, how God was there. Saving lives, both physically and spiritually, God was there. Locating the lost, both physically and spiritually, God was there. Healing bodies both physically and spiritually, God was there. Providing encouragement, strength, stability, patience, love, kindness, both physically and spiritually, God was there. You see, this is not something that we should take for granted on this anniversary date this Sunday morning. But it is also something that we should not have great fear about either. Because God is always there. And He always will be. That eerie quietness that I remember, and probably most of you remember exactly what you were doing at that time, on that date, what occurred, you'll never forget it. But that eerie quietness began a healing process that brought our nation back together. The next couple of nights, days, weeks, months, 
found us in God's house with God's people. It didn't matter what they looked like, the languages they spoke, the color of their skin. No, we made a pact to be united as Christians, united as Americans, united as those that wouldn't be fearful. Our president spoke up and said, we are Americans. We don't back down. We will not be forced out or forced to be quiet. Churches filled up. We made vows to return back to God. We made vows to get back in God's house. We prayed that if God would heal our land, we would come back to Him. Where are we 21 years later? As divided as ever. As busy as ever. As secular as ever. And most of us, including myself, as selfish as ever. It's, we've made it about us again. We forgot that God brought us through that. We're going to start our service out a little differently. I brought the flags in here for a reason. But I think we need more than that. I'm going to ask you to stand where you are. The choir, you can stay where you are, but stand. And I'm going to ask you to come down and fill the front up here as we pray for our nation together. So you come on. Don't wait. Don't worry about what anybody else is doing, looking around. Come and fill this pulpit area up. Fill our altar area up. We want to show that we're a united force, not only for the United States, but for our Father God. Come on down. Now you may remember, I do, I remember that first Wednesday night after that occurred. The church was as full on a Wednesday night as I'd ever seen it. There were people that I had not seen there in quite some time. And I thought, well, you know, this is the, this is the start of, of God doing something great and wonderful in our nation. And He did. But you know, just like all through God's Word, the people fell back and forgot, got comfortable, got lackadaisical. Well, guess what, folks? We're there again. I'm not telling you this to upset you. I'm not telling you this to beat you down. Our message today is going to be talking about being a Christian and living like a Christian. And I'm not telling you that so you'll feel bad. But we need a challenge. Every day. Because God has brought us through so much. Would you bow with me? And if you have room, just raising our hands to our Lord as we pray. If you don't, that's fine. Father, we come to you right now as a unified group. Knowing, first of all, that we need you, Lord. That we're nothing without you. And we like to think that we live in the greatest country ever. But without you, Lord, we will be the worst country ever. We need to put you first again. We need to make sure that everyone that we know knows where we stand and how we stand. We need to thank you on a day-to-day -day basis. We need to look our service men and women in the eye and thank them. And with a voice of pride, we need to tell them, thank you for, our, for your service, for protecting us, for watching out for us, for those lives, so many that were lost at 9-11, Lord, we pray that not a single life was lost in vain, that we will value those lives, what they stood for, how important it was that we got back on track and drew closer to you. But Father, we've forgotten. We've fallen away. It's time that we draw up close to you all over again. You haven't moved. 
You've always been there. We pray we would come back close to you. In the power of this moment of prayer, we have no power, but you have it all. We lift our voices. We lift up our concerns. We lift up our spirituality. We shed tears. We feel emotions. And we give it all to you that you would challenge us, not just here at, at New Home, not just in Union and Anson County, not just in North Carolina, but in all of our United States, that we would boldly come before you, Lord, pledging our allegiance to you, continuing to be one nation under God, Continuing to have your name on our coins, in our courthouses, and all put it back in those places that we've seen it taken down. Lord, if your people will humble themselves and call upon your name, then you will bless us. And we are doing that today. Bless us as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. That was great. Thank you so much. Well, I took up part of my time at the beginning, so I'll try my best not to hold you too long, but there are a few things that I would like to cover uh, this morning. The title of the message is Christian or an Award-Winning Performance. Now, I think each and every one of us, when we were small, we like to pretend, right? Like to pretend that you're somebody that you were not. Uh, I remember I uh, like to be uh, the star baseball player, you know, hitting that home run in the bottom of the ninth, the crowd cheering, or or back in my day, you know, we had basketball players like uh, Larry Bird, you remember him? He's old and gray now, or uh, Julius Irving, or maybe even just uh, wanted to be like dad, you know, pretend like your dad, wearing mom and dad's shoes around, pretending we're we're bigger than we were. It's fun to pretend, right? There you, this is where you can say yes. <laughs> it's fun to pretend. There's an original song, I think it was by the Platters, before my time, The Great Pretender. There's others that have, have, have made remakes of that. Elvis Presley, Roy Orbison, even the group Queen talking about what it meant to, to be somebody you're not, to put on a face, to, to put the shine on, as it were, to be something that you're really and truly just not. You know, when we're, when we're going out on that first date with that, that new sweetheart, we want to pretend to be all these things, but when you really get the eraser out and take some of those things off, we're, we're, we're just who we are. We, we don't have to be something that we're not. God made us like we are, not to be pretending to be something that we just are not. You know, there's actors, actresses that get paid a wad of money each year to play a part that they're not, pretending to be something that they're not, and they're so good at it, we remember them as the played part more so than we do their own names and if they do real good we give them this real big award what's it called an oscar oh, i did a little reading on that yesterday you know how, where that came from the the lady that was in charge the secretary of getting all that together she said the first one they made looked like her uncle oscar <laughs> so they just called it the oscar But seriously, many times we pretend to be something that we're not. And you know, pretenders can be found in all walks of life. You know, we, we, know, uh, we all know folks that proclaim to be able to do it all. They've done it all. They've been there and done that. Got two or three t-shirts. Hey, they know it. I think my grandfather called them jacks of all trade and masters of none. Well, let me just tell you, as pretenders can be found in all walks of life, we also know guys and gals that have opinions about everything. 
And they're always right. If you don't believe it, just ask them. And sometimes that rubs us the wrong way. And many times a pretender is a person who professes to be something because they want accolades. They want recognition. They want to stand out in the crowd. I think we've all been there. But let me just say that oftentimes pretenders deceive themselves by playing a role. Due to a practiced routine, it becomes an innate role that they do it out of pretentious day after day after day activity. And before long, their fruits of their labor will prove them out. If you want to be good at something, I think you would all agree you must work at it. You must practice at it. You must study it. You must live it and you must apply it. You must experience failures and downfalls. And every once in a while, we experience a victory. But we've got to go through the process. And you must engulf yourself in the work and the study of your work. How many of you here are really good at your jobs? Let me hear it. Hey, nobody thinks that you're good at your job. Let me see it. Are you good at your jobs? You must not like your jobs. You know, the, the, the old adage was, uh, find a job that you love and you'll never work a day in your life, right? You guys are working. You're, you're not enjoying it. Let me see that again. How many of you are good at your jobs? Nick back here, he went up like that. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> you practice at it, don't you? You work, you study, you, you put your heart, soul, and mind into it. If you're worth your salt, you want to be good at it. You want to be successful. You want people to say, hey, they are the best teachers ever, or, or they're the best plumbers ever, or, or they're the best mechanics ever. Or Nick, even you back there, they're the, they're the best IT guys ever. You know? You put your heart, mind, and soul in it. And it should be exciting to do. Don't pretend that you're something that you're not. I'm not cut out to do Nick's work. I can put some pipe in the ground, but I'm not cut out to be a plumber like Dale. I do a pretty good job with my paperwork and keeping things in order, but I'm not an accountant. And I don't pretend to be. If I did, it wouldn't take long for you to realize that's not what my strong suit is. The wonderful C.S. Lewis said something like this. He said, don't shine so others can see you shine. Shine so that through you, others can see him. Who is him? God, Jesus, our Father. Now let me just say without going any further... This message was tough for me to get together. Because every time I looked at something, I'm looking back at me. You know, when I, when I point at you, there's at least three fingers pointing back at me. So don't get hung up thinking that I'm trying to chastise you, beat you down, make you feel guilty. But I do hope that your and my attention are stirred in these next few minutes, and I'll try to be quick about it. And my prayer is that we will be encouraged to be more faithful, that we will be encouraged to be more committed, and we will be encouraged to be more obedient. Because with faith comes commitment. The Bible says it's impossible to serve God without faith. And once you have some of it, then it begins to grow. And once it grows, then you get committed to some things for God. And then you're obedient to follow him. Okay? Now, real quickly. In order for a Christian to be a Christian, to be called a Christian, to look like a Christian, you've got to do some Christian things. So hold on. Buckle your seatbelts for a minute. So 
What are Christian things? Well, number one, we got to be administering grace, humility, love to everyone. No matter what they've done in the past, what they're doing now, what they said. They, if they're one of those that's opinionated and they know everything, show some grace. Show some love. Be patient and be kind. Second thing as a Christian that makes other people know that we're Christian, we read His Word. And we pray. Not just when things are burning down. We do it daily, connecting with God regularly. Would you believe that statistics, and I read them again last night, showed that during COVID, 26 million people in the United States have stopped reading their Bible. 26 million. That's 11% less than before COVID. And now these are people that had been reading their Bibles, but they've become distraught during COVID and not reading the Bible. I don't like that. Take it a little further. Statistics in the U.S. show that 11% of all people read their Bible every day. 11%. 24% read it about one time a month. That's not good. And I would dare say that they're reading it because there's a tragic instance going on in their lives. Now, I'm not foolish enough to know and to pretend, not very good at pretending, that everyone reads their Bible. But I am serious enough to know that everyone should. The Bible has, this thing's aggravating me. The Bible has become a reverence, a reference book and not a staple of life. And let's not forget that the church right here where we sit right now is the training grounds for being a Christian, okay? But it's not the only training grounds. There's training at home. There's training uh, by yourself, reading, listening to the radio, watching other ministers preach. Uh, going down to the local place that you eat breakfast and associating with the men and women there. All these things define us as a Christian person because we're taking time out of our busy schedules to spend time with someone else. And it seems that many times, I'm sorry to say, we look for reasons not to attend church. We see we used to, years past, let me, let me just back up for a minute. So there was a time that I can remember as a young boy, I wanted those perfect attendance Sunday school things. You remember them? One time a year, you'd get them out and you'd hang them up here. I remember the guy from, from New Hope, I think he had 17 of them. He was in his 80s, but he had 17 of them. I wanted to get some of them. So what would I do when the, when the family was on vacation? Hey, Mom, we got to go to church on vacation. Oh, well, that's good. We'll go to preach. No, we got to go to Sunday school. We got to go to Sunday school on vacation because I want to get my medal. Some of you are shaking your head. You remember? What, what happened to them? Why don't, we, why don't we talk about that anymore? It's, it's, it's just not important. But it should be. Guess what? There's a Sunday school teacher that prepared a lesson for you. That God gave them the knowledge to do so. And they weren't pretending to prepare it. They prepared. And they wanted you there. To experience with them. And draw closer to God through it. As a pastor, I attempt to prepare what God's given me that week. And sometimes it's the 11th hour. Because I'm waiting. Now sometimes I'm waiting because I hadn't done my due diligence. I hadn't reached out to God enough. I hadn't been on my knees enough. I hadn't paid attention enough. You know, it's hard-headed sometimes. But each and every time that you come to church, I would dare say that you've never left here and said, I wish I hadn't gone. I didn't get something out of it. You can say, well, I didn't like this. I didn't enjoy that. 
All those things. But each and every time God meets you when you meet God. And that's usually here. It's not just done because it's Sunday morning and you need to be here. It's done out of the love and reverence of God. Let's move on a little quicker. If God's people call according to God's purpose, born again believers don't faithfully attend church, what message are we sending to the general public? Whatever happened to bringing the kids and the whole family to Sunday school and preaching together? Bringing the grandkids, bringing the neighbor's kids. Moms and dads coming together in church, sitting on the pew together and holding hands. Now we sit 10 feet apart, men and women. Why? Show your kids and your grandkids that you love one another. Show them that you're happily married, that you enjoyed the years, the 20, 30, 40, and 50s together. It, it shows an example of godly love. I had a great grandfather. He was called the candy man at his church. He brought the candy. He brought the gum. The favorite thing was uh, uh, Wrigley's uh, Juicy Fruit. Yeah, you remember those? Juicy Fruit gum. Man, that was good, wasn't it? Huh? For five seconds, yeah. It didn't last very long. <clears throat> But let me just tell you, the kids look forward to seeing Papa Blair because he always had the gum. And Papa Blair loved it. He didn't have a whole lot of money to his name, but he had a top drawer full of juicy fruit because <laughs> he was taking it every Sunday. And he knew the kids were looking forward to it. Let me just say, I hardly ever and never preach about giving you guys are such great supporters you support our missions you it's been great but let me just remind you that it's between you and god of whether you're giving your tithes and offerings or not i'm not going to come knock on your door and say we didn't get so and so from you last month i don't know that and don't want to it's between you and god if you support the north carolina missions offering it's between you and God if he's, if he's laid a great blessing of finances in your lap over the last couple of months and you ain't blessed him back. I guarantee you he's nudging you and he's telling you. You can keep beating him back if you want to, but when he's blessing you, he's wanting you to bless others. And it's the same way with our church. We don't grow a great big offering. There's no need in that. We need enough money to do what we got to do. The rest, we need to support missions. We need to make sure others come to know Jesus Christ. That's why we're here as a church. Finally, real quickly, if you have your Bibles, turn with me and let's look at Psalms chapter 1. And I'm going to read these quickly and then I'm going to turn right back to Matthew chapter 6. Psalm chapter 1 says these words, all the joy of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers. You know what mockers are? The mockers are the ones that say, you know, I don't see many miracles anymore. Do you? You ever, ever had anybody tell you that? I, I, don't, I don't see God working much around anymore. Do you? What's your, what's your, uh, Reply to that. He's always on the job. That's right. That's mockers. Don't be a mocker. Verse 2. But they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They're like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do prosper in all they do prosper in all they do does not mean you'll never have any trouble never have any heartaches never have any struggles no you prosper in all you do because you're faithful enough to know that god's got it not you not me god's got it and then we're talking about our giving let's let's look real quickly at matthew chapter 6 Verse 1, watch out, watch out, get in our attention. Don't do your good deeds publicly 
to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. A good example of that, people that give big money, they want their name on a building. What good is that? Yeah, get it in the paper. I don't know. I guess that's, if they want to put your name on there because you did something great, that's one thing. But don't, don't do it to get that recognition. He says, I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. Sometimes he will even reward you publicly, and you didn't know it was coming. But many times, most times, not. You see, there should be no reward for being obedient to what God has asked us to do. Our reward was served up on a cross. Our reward is stored up in heaven. We're not looking for awards and rewards here. Now let me just finish this way. So, we won't have time to read all the scripture. But you know who Satan is, right? Satan was once called Lucifer. Light bearer. Lucifer was not a bad thing at one time. Lucifer was a cherubim angel. He was there at the beginning of time at Adam and Eve. He was in the garden. He was a good angel. But Lucifer began to beat his chest and said, I want to be like God. I want the accolades of God. I want to rise up into the heavens and serve with God. God said, no way. You can go back and read this in Ezekiel 28. You can also pick up on it in Isaiah chapter 14. God forced him down. You see, he had popularity. He had good looks. He had everything at his fingertips. But he wanted more and more and more. This is the same Lucifer, the same Satan who tempted Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. You remember what he told Jesus? Look at all this out here. If you'll bow down to me, I'll give it all to you. Jesus, the Son of God, knew who owned it all. It certainly wasn't Satan. But we get our minds confused. Because Satan wants to warm us up to all these things out here, these so-called pleasures of the world. And then we begin to pretend like we can participate out there, but if we'll go to church on Sunday, it'll all be okay. Now, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. Anytime that you feel that you've sinned against God and you ask for forgiveness, he pushes it away as far as the east is from the west. But he did not continue for us to go back and do those sins over and over and over. The scripture says, like a dog returns to his vomit. That's the way we return to our sin. So here's the thing. If we call ourselves Christians, then let's behave like Christians. Here, today, out there, tomorrow, out there, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Friday nights, wherever you go, Saturdays, wherever you go, when you get the opportunity to do great things for others, do it as a Christian. Don't look around to see who's patting you on the back. Don't make sure that your name's on a list, that you did this and that. Don't speak out when you don't need to be heard from. Just do what God's called us to do. And let the chips fall where they may. Not pretending to be something that we're not. We've seen that trailer on that movie, Play the Flute. Do you remember what the, the, the young smart alecky boy asked the group, do you think we really want to read the Bible? Did you catch that? 
Now they kind of giggled. They looked around. He, he wanted a little power. He wanted to say, well, I'm not reading the Bible, so I'm sure they're not. You know? But the fact of the matter is, there were some that were reading it. And it plays out in your life. Oh, sure, there's times that I've got up in the morning or made it to lunchtime and realized that I haven't took my quiet time. It's my fault. And there's times that I say, well, I don't have time today or, or I don't want to or I don't feel like it or I got these things happening, those things happening. But each and every time that you pick it up, what happens? You feel a closeness to God by just holding it in your hand. Let's get back to it, shall we? Let's get back on our knees in prayers to others. Let's don't live a mockery, as it were. It's easy to leave church and say, well, did you see what so-and-so did or what they said or how they were dressed? Or That's not what Christians do. Christians look for ways to help and love on others. That's what we should be. I'm going to ask you to stand. We've exhausted our time. Tim, come and lead us in a, in a hymn of invitation. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer. And please, don't think I'm beating you down. I suffer with the same issues, struggles, selfishness, busyness. It's hard. It's very hard to weigh it all out. But start... Start by overwhelming yourself with obedience to Christ first. And then He will allow the other things to fall into place. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank You for this day. We thank You without a doubt. We need You, Lord. As we have celebrated the, the 21st anniversary of 9-11, we know that through chaotic situations, we need You. But more so than that, Lord, we need you every day, no matter what's occurring, what's in front of us or what's behind us. We know without a doubt that if we'll give it to you and allow you to lead the way, then you'll put us in a better perspective. Lord, this morning, as we've talked about what it looks like to pretend, I pray that we're not pretending to be Christians. We're not pretending to put on a face to come to your house and behave like we should and then not following it, dear God. Lord, we all have sin in our lives. At times we have unconfessed sin. Lord, I pray right now that where we are standing, we'll bring them to you. We'll ask for forgiveness and we'll be encouraged by you taking them away, Lord. And then as we're washed afresh and anew, we will feel what it feels like to be clean again, washed white as snow. Lord, I know there's hurting hearts here. There's people going through tough, tough things. But Lord, I know that you're there with them. I pray that they'll cry out to you and reach out to you. And if there's someone here today who needs to rededicate their life or lay something down, I pray that they'll be obedient to come to the altar. If there's someone here that needs to know you as Savior, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. We just celebrated baptism last week, and I wish we could do it every week. But you work as only you can, Lord. Help us to be obedient to your calling and whatever you've asked us to do during this invitation time. In Jesus' name, amen.